Good day, everybody. This is Chris at the Ancient Scholar. Hope this video finds you all doing well. Today, I'm going to review a case study that is associated with a rather unique ECG. So let's go ahead and get started. So in this particular situation, you're called to the scene of a 68-year-old male patient with acute onset chest pain. Uh, he has uh, the typical uh, history that you would expect uh, hypertension, elevated lipids, plus or minus diabetes. This pain has been going on for the last 30 minutes. It has not resolved with rest. And you immediately perform a 12 lead ECG. And this is what we have. So let's go ahead and uh, analyze this 12 lead ECG. And so we start with our standard I see all leads systematic approach for interpreting 12 leads, and we see the following. We see ST elevation in leads 2, 3, and AVF. I'll point that out here. All right, so, so far this uh, seems very consistent with an inferior wall STEMI involving the right coronary artery. Uh, we see some depression in leads 1 and AVL, the hilateral leads. Um, we would expect that uh, to be reciprocal, and so that is even more compelling evidence that we are, in fact, dealing with an inferior wall STEMI. So really nothing out of the ordinary, so to speak, uh, other than the fact that our patient is, is having an acute myocardial infarction, of course. Uh, but let's move on and, and analyze the rest of the 12 lead ECG. So we look at um, our septal leads, uh, V1 and V2 here, and we've got a little bit of depression in V2, and in V1 we have a slight bit of um, interesting changes, maybe a little bit of elevation, and then we move on to the anterior leads, and we've got V3 and V4, and we notice pretty substantial ST elevation in the anterior leads. And then moving on to the lateral leads, V5, V6, 1 and AVL. Uh, we've already noted 1 and AVL, but we see ST elevation in V5 and V6 as well. So what do we have going on here? Well, we seem to have acute ST segment changes in both the right and left side of the heart. And these changes are associated with signs and symptoms that suggest an acute coronary syndrome as opposed to some other um, issue. So what are we thinking here? This is kind of a unique situation. This is not something that we run into typically, right? And we need to think about differentials here. And what are some differentials? Well, one differential that I could think of that, that might account for what we're dealing with is the fact that, that perhaps we have um, an aorta and a di dissection involving the aortic arch that is dissected uh, back in toward the aortic valve and it is compromising both the right coronary and left coronary artery. That's certainly possible. Um, however, this particular patient doesn't have any of the other signs and symptoms of, of a, an aortic dissection, such as uh, hoarseness or unequal blood pressures um, in the extremities or unequal pulses of the extremities or any tearing pressure or sensation, but it is certainly a dissection. Um, another thing to consider in this particular patient is perhaps we're dealing, we're just simply dealing with multi-vessel compromise, right? Perhaps I have occlusions of both the right and left uh, coronary arteries. That's certainly possible, not very common, but it's certainly possible. Um, and the third, or rather a third differential that I want to think about, and this will be the topic of this discussion, is perhaps this patient has something called a wraparound left anterior descending artery, a wraparound LAD. 
What is a wraparound LED? Well, let's talk about it. So when we look at the left anterior descending artery, uh, this is an angiogram, and um, I went ahead and I'm citing the references from where I obtained this. When we do an angiogram and we look at the left anterior descending artery, uh, in this particular diagram, this is the left main here, so this is where the proximal left coronary artery comes off of the aortic arch, and it branches or it bifurcates into the left anterior descending here, and then the left circumflex here, and you've got the obtuse marginal, et cetera. Uh, we're gonna focus on this left anterior descending artery here. And um, you should note that right here is the apex of the heart, of the left ventricle. And a normal left anterior descending artery will go all the way down to the apex of the heart, all right? And this is what we call a type one, or rather a type two left anterior descending artery. A type two LAD is a left anterior descending artery that goes all the way to the apex. If the left anterior descending artery does not go all the way to the apex, we tend to call that a type one left anterior descending artery. And then if the left anterior descending artery wraps around the apex and begins to supply the posterior and inferior walls, we call that a type three left anterior descending artery. And this is the situation that I'm talking about. Uh, type three left anterior descending artery is also known or also referred to as a wraparound LAD. It wraps around uh, the back of the heart into the uh, posterior interventricular groove and begins to supply the posterior and, or, or the uh, inferior and possibly parts of the posterior wall. So if you have occlusion of a wraparound left anterior descending artery, what you're gonna get is you're going to get uh, changes associated with left-sided heart issues, right? So uh, think about the um, anterior septal and perhaps lateral changes, but you're also going to get inferior changes because parts of the inferior wall the right side, the back of the heart, the posterior wall are being perfused by this left anterior descending artery that's uh, blocked. And uh, we see this in approximately 15% of patients. So approximately 15% of patients will have a type three left anterior descending artery. And the reason that this is important, as you might imagine, is these patients are going to be at higher risk for increased morbidity and mortality should they have acute compromise of their left anterior descending artery because that LAD supplies a larger area of the heart than usual. And you may not have a good um, crossover or collateral circulation from the right side, right? That can pick up the slack, um, ideally, the LAD should come very close to the PDA, the posterior descending artery that's supplying the back of the heart to where you can even get a little bit of, a little bit of crossover. Um, and so you have some, um, you have some collateral circulation. And I should say before I move on to the next slide that um, I understand there is also a type four LAD that is sometimes talked about. And as I understand, a type 4 LAD is a type of what's known as a dual or split LAD, where the left anterior descending artery has two main components to it. Um, and as I understand, that's a fairly rare situation, and it's not the point of this particular video. Okay, so let's move on and take a closer look at what a type 3 LAD or a wraparound LAD looks like via angiography. All right, so here we have an example of a wraparound LAD 
here's where I referenced this image from. All right, so we go up here. So you have got um, the left main right here. Um, you even have the right coronary artery over here as well. Uh, we're going to focus on the left main. So the left main, let's see if we can zoom out there. Sorry about that. Left main comes down and becomes the LAD. And right here is the apex of the heart. And you can see that this goes all the way to the apex and then wraps around. And it is now supplying parts of the inferior wall of the heart with uh, perfusion. And so if you were to compromise this suddenly, not only are you going to have antroseptal and perhaps lateral uh, changes, but you're also going to compromise the inferior wall and you're going to get these unique ECG changes that we saw at the beginning of the video. Does this, from a pre-hospital perspective, change our treatment? No, not fundamentally. It, uh, it's still going to be a code heart. This is still a patient that needs to go urgently to the cath lab, but what we need to understand is that these patients are going to be at higher risk for morbidity and mortality uh, during our care and during the hospital care. And so this is someone that you want to pay very close attention to. All right, everyone, hopefully you found this uh, video interesting and helpful, and hopefully you understand the concept of wraparound LAD and how it can have implications when it comes to acute coronary syndrome. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you in the next video.